Hello, thank you for joining us for this Balliol lecture on Toussaint Louverture, the Black Spartacus of Saint-Domingue. So I'm going to start by just giving a quick thumbnail sketch of Toussaint Louverture. Um, he was born in uh, the early 1740s in the French colony of Saint-Domingue in the Caribbean. Saint-Domingue at the time was uh, the wealthiest, the most prosperous French colony. Um, it produced uh, vast quantities of sugar, coffee, cocoa, indigo, and it was known as the Pearl of the Antilles. Um, but it was a, a, a wealth which rested entirely on slavery, um, on the institution of slavery. And Toussaint Louverture um, was the uh, leader who led the enslaved people of uh, the colony of Saint-Domingue towards emancipation. Um, he was one of the leaders of the uh, revolt of the enslaved people there in the early 1790s. And this revolt forced the uh, French uh, authorities to recognize uh, uh, the freedom of the enslaved people in 1793, um, which in turn uh, led to the uh, Emancipation Decree of 1794 by the French uh, Legislative Assembly, the Convention. So by that time, Toussaint Louverture has emerged as one of the great uh, political leaders uh, uh, in Saint-Domingue. Uh, and his career is then uh, remarkable. He has this meteoric uh, ascension, uh, which um, leads him first uh, through a series of uh, military victories to free um, his homeland from slave-supporting uh, uh, occupying forces um, uh, from, the, from, from Spain and from Great Britain. Um, and then he rises to the rank of general in the French Republican army in Saint-Domingue, uh, eliminates his uh, domestic and French rivals, establishes commercial links um, with the United States, and um, his career culminates in 1801 in the promulgation of a Republican constitution, uh, which basically appoints him as governor for life, uh, abolishes slavery forever, and effectively makes uh, the colony of Saint-Domingue an autonomous entity within the French colonial empire. Now, unfortunately, this uh, displeases the French authorities. By then, uh, Napoleon Bonaparte has emerged as the French uh, leader, and Napoleon sends uh, an invading force to um, uh, uh, re reconquer uh, Saint-Domingue. Um, this invading army uh, captures Toussaint in 1802 and uh, 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 places him under arrest, sends him back to uh, France where he dies in 1803. However, um, the uh, army of Saint-Domingue, which is still led by uh, many of Toussaint's lieutenants, including the uh, uh, remarkable general Jean-Jacques Dessalines, this army fights a war of national liberation against the French troops, uh, defeats them, and uh, uh, declares independence in uh, 1804. And that is when the uh, state of Haiti um, is born, uh, the world's first um, black independent post-colonial state. So Toussaint Louverture is um, this remarkable figure who emerges in the uh, late 18th century. He's a warrior. He's a founding father. I mean, the, the, the state of Haiti, although he's no longer there when uh, Haiti is born, he is clearly one of its founding fathers. Um, he's a philosopher, uh, a man who has a, a very original set of ideas, which I will talk about um, in a minute. Um, and uh, he's a nation builder. He's someone who um, uh, uh, forges um, through his uh, ideas and through his practices in the 1790s a new nation, um, a new people, uh, creates a new people. And, and for all these reasons, I think he's um, this remarkable uh, figure. So um, what I want to do uh, uh, before going into some details is just to say a word about uh, the sources that I used to, um, to write this book uh, about Toussaint Louverture. Um, he is um, someone who uh, uh, 
left behind uh, a, a large paper trail um, because he was both uh, a general in the French Republican Army, but also a senior administrator. So the bulk um, of his papers are in the French colonial archives, uh, which I used, um, but also by nature of his uh, interactions with the Spaniards, the British, um, the Americans. You find uh, papers from Toussaint um, in uh, archives uh, uh, in, in the United States, in Spain uh, and in Great Britain as well. And so um, this is a book which relies heavily on uh, archival sources um, in these different countries. Um, and in particular, what I tried to do, my, my primary ambition um, in writing this book was really to try and use as many sources by Toussaint himself, um, because he was a voracious uh, learner, but also someone who um, uh, wrote a lot. Um, he had, uh, at the height of his power, he uh, wrote several hundred letters every day. Um, he used to dictate to several secretaries um, uh, at the same time. And so, uh, uh, unfortunately, not all of these letters have survived, but uh, a considerable number of them have. And what I tried to do was to read every single one of them so that uh, I would be able to recapture his voice because he has a very um, distinctive voice, um, uh, proud, um, eloquent, playful, um, sometimes arrogant. Um, but it's the voice of a very singular Republican revolutionary. And uh, I tried to do my best to um, uh, bring it, restore this voice. Um, uh, so that we could all savor um, his exceptional qualities as a revolutionary leader. Um, it wasn't always easy, I should say, also, even though um, we have a lot of archives about him. The other thing that's also uh, uh, interesting and challenging about uh, writing a biography of someone like him is that um, he doesn't always uh, reveal um, uh, uh, his inner thoughts or his intentions on some big issues. Um, we have to read between the lines. He needed to be careful about um, how he expressed himself. Um, and also he sometimes deliberately uh, tried to mislead people um, because that obviously made sense from a tactical or a strategic point of view. So um, Toussaint is also a, a, an interesting figure um, uh, as a, for a biographer because he's someone who uh, 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 doesn't make it easy for you always to understand what exactly um, he's trying to do. But I think, nonetheless, there is a very coherent um, uh, underlying set of objectives um, that he's pursuing. And, and these are the objectives that I will try and uh, lay out for you um, in this lecture. What I want to do is really to talk not too much about him as an individual, but really um, in this in this lecture to uh, through the uh, uh, figure of Toussaint to talk to you about some of the bigger themes that uh, his leadership um, uh, brings forth. Um, in other words, why is it interesting uh, to focus on him uh, beyond um, his exceptional qualities as an individual? Well, I think he's. Is particularly fascinating um, for a number of wider reasons, and it's these wider reasons that I'd like to um, focus on um, at this point. I want to start really by um, uh, highlighting the uh, uh, exceptionally rich quality and character of the Haitian Revolution itself. This is the revolution of which Toussaint was um, one of the principal leaders, I, I would say the principal leader, and this revolution um, begins in 1791, as I mentioned, with um, the uh, uh, insurrection of the enslaved people of Saint-Domingue, and it culminates in 1804 with uh, the independence um, of Haiti. Now, Toussaint is interesting because he is part of this uh, remarkable revolution, a revolution which for a long time was um, uh, uh, kept slightly um, uh, in the margins of um, the historiography. When people uh, wrote about uh, uh, this period, which is sometimes referred to as the age of revolutions, you know, the late 18th, early 19th century, 
people tended often to talk about the American Revolution uh, and the French Revolution and not to pay too much attention to the Haitian Revolution. Um, I think, however, the Haitian Revolution is uh, perhaps the most uh, uh, interesting example of revolutionary activity during this period. Um, it's the most interesting revolution because it's the most comprehensive revolution, right? It's a revolution that is um, uh, uh, all at once uh, uh, a democratic revolution, a republican revolution, um, and it culminates um, in a war of uh, uh, national liberation. Um, uh, it's also, uh, I think, um, interesting because it is the most radical revolution. Certainly if you compare it to the French and um, the American revolutions, and particularly if you look at the issue of slavery, you see that uh, the American revolution doesn't really confront uh, the issue of slavery at all. Um, uh, you know, emancipation is something that occurs only uh, much later um, in America in the um, uh, after the Civil War in the 1860s. And the French, even though they abolished slavery in 1794, they restore, uh, under Napoleon, slavery is restored in um, many of the French colonies in the early 19th century. Whereas um, in Saint-Domingue, Saint-Domingue, which then goes on to become Haiti, you have um, <clears throat> a radical revolution which comprehensively abolishes slavery and uh, maintains that abolition. And indeed, um, it's a revolution that then serves as, a, as an inspiration or as a beacon for uh, anti-slavery struggles elsewhere in the Atlantic world. And so um, that's my second point. Um, I think that if we think about um, the Haitian Revolution and Toussaint Louverture's leadership in it, the other major issue that it uh, brings us to immediately is the question of slavery and the question of resistance to slavery. Because one of the very exciting things in uh, the um, study of uh, uh, enslavement uh, particularly in the 18th and 19th centuries now, is that we're discovering how um, fiercely uh, uh, the enslaved people um, resisted um, their condition. Um, uh, slavery was not something that was accepted um, at any time by the enslaved themselves. They fought against it um, by um, all means possible. And one of the things that I found very um, uh, remarkable was to see how the example of Saint-Domingue in the 1790s, right, the examples of the, the enslaved people led by Toussaint Louverture, um, provide for um, other um, enslaved uh, men and women um, in the Caribbean and in the Atlantic. Um, there are examples of um, rebellions um, in places like Jamaica, uh, Venezuela, um, Cuba. I mean, for example, in Cuba uh, between 1795 and uh, 18, 1812, you have no fewer than 19 uh, uh, different um, insurrections by enslaved people. Um, and uh, what this underlines beyond the individual figure of Toussaint and, and indeed beyond the Haitian Revolution itself is that there was... Um, what you might call uh, a black international, um, an international of um, anti, anti-slavery resistors. Um, uh, 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 there clearly are uh, across um, the, the Atlantic world at that time um, interconnections that are established by people who are fighting against slavery. And at the heart of that fight against slavery is um, what happens in Saint-Domingue under the leadership of Toussaint Louverture. So um, this is one of the exciting comparative um, features of the Haitian Revolution, that it's a revolution that is very important in its own terms, in terms of what it achieves, but it's also a revolution that acts as, a, as an inspiration for uh, other men and women elsewhere in the Atlantic world um, to try and um, fight, fight off um, uh, their enslavement.
Thirdly, I think um, Toussaint Louverture and the Haitian Revolution are, are, are interesting because, of course, um, they confront um, the issue of race. Um, now, um, Toussaint is uh, himself particularly important here because um, throughout uh, the 1790s and early 1800s, um, he talks uh, uh, about race um, and has a very specific um, uh, uh, discourse um, uh, about it, which I uh, uh, investigate and analyze in the book. And the key concept in Toussaint's mind um, is fraternity or brotherhood. Um, he, he often talks about uh, uh, his aspiration to create uh, a new political community in Saint-Domingue, and it's a political community which is based on this idea of brotherhood or, or fraternity. Um, Brotherhood for him um, is uh, a multi-layered um, concept. Uh, uh, he talks uh, very, very much. I'd say there are two um, complementary dimensions of brotherhood in Toussaint Louverture's mind. Firstly, uh, he uses it um, uh, constantly when he's talking about um, one of his fundamental political aspirations, which is the unity of the black people of Saint-Domingue. Um, uh, just some basic uh, figures about the uh, uh, ethnic composition of the uh, population in Saint-Domingue in the late 18th century. You have about 30 to 35,000 uh, white European settlers uh, in, the, uh, in the colony, about 30, 30 35,000 uh, people of mixed race, and 500,000 um, uh, black uh, uh, slaves. So uh, a huge uh, uh, population of enslaved men and women. And the important thing to remember about this population of enslaved men and women is that by the late 18th century, um, something like 60% of them were not born in Saint-Domingue. In other words, they were captured as young, uh, uh, young uh, 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 men and women um, in Africa, in Central and or West Africa, and brought to the colony of Saint-Domingue, where they were, um, where they were enslaved and sold off and uh, and set to work mostly um, in uh, uh, in plantations, but they they came from very different uh, parts uh, of of Africa, uh, often spoke very different languages, and. Um, had different religious uh, spiritual beliefs. In other words, um, these were not people who yet, um, in the early 1790s, saw each other um, as a political community with shared values. And one of Toussaint's great objectives, which he achieves, in fact, by the late 1790s, is out of this um, very diverse uh, community to create, um, to help create a people. In other words, a people who saw themselves, despite their different origins, uh, uh, as um, sharing a set of um, uh, civic political values. And, and that's one of the uh, truly remarkable achievements of Toussaint Louverture as uh, a political leader. So um, this idea of uh, black unity, the unity between the different components of um, the black community in Saint-Domingue is something that is very important to him. Um, the other thing that's really important to him, uh, and, and it's another feature of his leadership, is his attachment to what we would call today the creation of a multiracial republic. In other words, um, what's striking about his ambition is that um, he wants a, a, a liberated Saint-Domingue, once it's free of slavery and free of um, uh, the occupation of British and Spanish forces, what he wants is to create a political community in which white people, mixed race people and black people live um, on a footing of um, civil and political equality, where they enjoy equal rights, um, but are part of uh, a shared uh, uh, community of destiny. Um, and, and that also is his idea of brotherhood. In other words, his, his concept of brotherhood is not limited to one political community. He really does aspire to create um, this uh, multiracial um, uh, political community. Um, 
Fourthly, I want to say something briefly about uh, Toussaint as a, a, a revolutionary leader. Um, I think what is really remarkable um, about him, uh, if one if one is looking at the Haitian Revolution as uh, as, a, as, a, as an exemplar of revolutionary leadership, is how Toussaint is able to combine certain uh, exceptional individual qualities. I mean, he has all the qualities that one associates with um, successful revolutionary leaders. I mean, he's determined, um, he's exceptionally intelligent, um, he's creative, um, he is uh, uh, determined. I mean, he has a very clear set of objectives that he wants to achieve. Um, but I think what's also striking about his revolutionary leadership is his capacity to draw on um, the collective strength of his people. And I think um, if I had to summarize um, Toussaint's uh, skill and effectiveness as a revolutionary leader, I would say that it's in his uh, capacity to combine um, in the, in these individual qualities and these collective qualities um, uh, it's it's the combination of these two that give Toussaint this remarkable um, this remarkable uh, uh, quality. Um, and in saying that, what I'm also highlighting is the richness and the creativity of um, the popular participation um, in the Haitian Revolution. Because this is a revolution which, unlike some others um, which we've seen in history. Um, later on, for example, the, the Bolshevik Revolution, which is very clearly the work of a minority, um, uh, uh, you know, an active minority, uh, but a minority nonetheless. At its height, um, the revolution in Saint-Domingue in the late 18th century is the work of um, the majority of the black people. Um, it's a majority of the enslaved men and women who... Um, uh, 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 rise up in arms in 1791 against the against the slave owners, um, and it's a majority of uh, uh, black people who who are behind Toussaint Louverture during the 1790s, and indeed um, it's a majority of um, the black people who um, uh, wage a war, uh, wage and support the war of national liberation, which is fought against the French um, in the early 19th century, leading on to um, Haitian independence. So um, <clears throat> I suppose um, the point there is that in in uh, revolutionary times, in times of successful revolutions, what you need is both uh, 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 individual leadership, strong individual leadership, and, and Toussaint had this, um, but also uh, a leadership that is strong because it is able to rely on um, the the energy, the creativity. Uh, the determination of the people of Saint-Domingue. And it's that, uh, uh, it's that uh, connection between the two that I think Toussaint really um, exemplifies um, uh, in, in this remarkable way. I want here also to say a word about Toussaint's um, political thought. Um, one of the fascinating things about him is that um, he is a very original uh, political thinker. And here um, I should say something about perhaps um, uh, uh, if if anyone has read anything about Toussaint or the Haitian Revolution, it would be this wonderful book by C.L.R. James, The Black Jacobins, um, which is a wonderful book. And uh, uh, I still recommend it very warmly to anyone who's starting to, to learn about the Haitian Revolution. Um, I see my own book as one which complements um, the uh, the enterprise uh, of C.L.R. James because what C.L.R. James basically does, and, and you see it in the title of the book, is that he regards Toussaint Louverture and the Haitian revolutionaries as disciples of the French Revolution, hence the title, Black Jacobins. These are uh, 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 people who are following um, the inspiration, both the intellectual and the uh, practical inspiration given by the um, uh, Jacobin Revolution in the early 1790s. And while I think this is true, um, I think if you look at Toussaint Louverture's ideas, you see that he is someone who um, has read some of the classics of the uh, Enlightenment particularly the works of Rousseau, uh, Diderot, and Reynal, um, 
and uh, he's someone who fundamentally um, is uh, uh, echoing the radical enlightenment uh, attempts to um, uh, combat slavery and fight for a, a more uh, equal and just society. Um, however, I think what is exciting about Toussaint Louverture and the Haitian revolutionaries is that this is not the only um, intellectual inspiration um, that uh, uh, drives their action. Um, they are also driven by a whole series of African political influences. Toussaint Louverture's father was uh, a senior official in the kingdom of Alada, and from his father he learned a lot of things, um, whether they were political, cultural, uh, military, um, and, and these remained uh, part of his heritage. He spoke the Fon language, um, so his African heritage was something that mattered to him and that shaped um, his political thought. Uh, and also, um, Toussaint is a son of the Caribbean, um, and, and, and his Caribbean uh, identity also mattered hugely to him. He was a devout Catholic. He was someone who uh, exhibited a particular closeness to nature. Um, uh, and uh, above all, he was someone who uh, knew about and uh, to a certain extent uh, practiced the emerging Vodou religion, which is the, the national religion of Haiti um, to this day. So he's someone who I think is best described, his republicanism uh, is best described um, as a Creole republicanism, uh, a republicanism of métissage, you know, mixing, combining different elements. And I think it's these combinations that really um, underscore the, um, the uh, potency of um, Toussaint Louverture and the Haitian Revolution. It's this capacity constantly to um, uh, have this dialogue between uh, Europe, Africa, and the Caribbean. Um, and, um, and you see it um, in the name, Toussaint Louverture. When Toussaint was born and, and brought up as an enslaved person, um, uh, he was referred to uh, uh, by the name of the plantation where his father um, worked. So he was called Toussaint Breda, uh, Breda being the name of the plantation in the north of Saint-Domingue. Um, Toussaint becomes uh, Toussaint Louverture in 1793, two years after the uh, launching of the uh, insurrection of the enslaved people. And the name Louverture is facing... in. Um, a number of different ways. Uh, it, it, it's a nod to the Enlightenment and to the idea of opening oneself to new ideas, ouverture in, in that uh, classic Enlightenment sense. But also um, it's a reference to one of the spirits of the Vodou religion called Papa Legba. Um, and Legba is the spirit who allows you to make the transition from uh, one uh, aspect uh, or one moment of your life into another. Um, so he's the person who uh, uh, gives you an opening, literally. So when Toussaint chooses his name, he's speaking both to his European, um, to his French and European supporters and followers, but also to uh, the men and women who were African born and would recognize in that name um, a reference, a coded reference to um, uh, uh, Vodou spirituality. And this is a very classic example of the way Toussaint Louverture um, constantly operated. Um, I also want to say a little word about Toussaint's originality when it comes to colonial governance, um, because he is operating in a, in a colonial context, and I think it's really interesting to see how uh, throughout the period between the mid-1790s and the early 1800s, he actually goes about trying to create um, basically a new type of colonial administration. Um, and I think what is very striking here is that um, his fundamental objective um, is not to uh, fight for independence. Um, instead, he was trying to work towards um, what later becomes known as autonomy, um, and uh, this was uh, uh, something that was original, right? Obviously, the French hadn't yet uh, invented uh, the notion of uh, autonomous um, self-government. Um, in fact, um, the French themselves only start to talk about autonomy um, 
something like 150 years later, which gives us all a sense of how um, uh, uh, how how far Toussaint was ahead of his time. Um, but I think um, uh, one of the striking things when it comes to Toussaint, um, and this is why his 1801 constitution is such a big landmark, is that he's trying to define um, a new uh, set of arrangements, a new understanding of how uh, a colony can govern itself in its own uh, interests and in the interests of its people, while at the same time remaining part of um, the uh, greater French family. Um, and I think it's one of the great tragedies in the history of uh, French colonialism and indeed in the history of colonialism more generally that this experiment of colonial autonomy um, was not recognized by the French. So the people of Saint-Domingue had to um, uh, go for independence, um, ultimately, which they achieved. But I think that if Toussaint's experiment in colonial autonomy had succeeded, I think it would have given us really quite an interesting uh, test case of how far um, local uh, indigenous people um, could, could have been allowed um, an element of freedom Within, um, within this colonial context. Last but not least, I think Toussaint and the Haitian Revolution are uh, worthy of our attention because this is a story about uh, uh, the empowerment of men and women, um, men and women who are fighting slavery, but also men and women who are uh, fighting against colonialism. And indeed, one of the uh, 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 wonderful qualities of uh, to Saint Louverture's image is that even after he dies um, uh, in 1803, he and the Haitian Revolution become this um, uh, a beacon for uh, uh, generations of men and women who are fighting uh, oppression. Um, indeed, the Haitian Revolution is at the heart of um, uh, the uh, imagination uh, of. Um, uh, people fighting slavery um, in the course of the 19th century, um, fighting colonialism, fighting for racial justice, um, fighting for self-determination. And one of the things I'm able to do in the book is really to trace the, the way in which across two centuries, quite literally, um, Toussaint Louverture and the Haitian revolutionaries are able to inspire um, all these different struggles. Uh, if you take the example of the United States of America, you see that all the way up to the Civil War and even um, uh, much later, the struggle for um, African-American civil rights is a struggle which African-American leaders themselves, um, uh, uh, in which uh, African-American leaders themselves pay tribute to the Haitian Revolution and to um, the figure of Toussaint Louverture. So he's someone who becomes a, a, a veritable myth and legend, uh, and he also inspires uh, uh, great artists, uh, writers, um, poets from uh, Wordsworth in the early um, 19th century, all the way up to uh, John Agard um, in our time. So this is a, an absolutely remarkable um, story, and I think it still has uh, a lot to inspire us um, in our present moment when the fight for racial justice and racial equality, uh, of course, is one that is um, still ongoing. So on that note, I thank you very much for your attention and look forward to um, exchanging with you um, in the question and answer session. Thanks very much.